So early on in our collecting history, 1970s, 1980s, everything was hard to find. We finally, uh, in, the, in the, about the 19, late 1970s, decided to go to a show in Indy called the Indiana Show. This show was one of the best advertising shows in the country. It was held in Indianapolis, Indiana, three times a year, spring, summer, and fall. And this is probably really where our collection started to, to really take off. We met a lot of people up there that were that were uh, had 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 country store stuff, and we met people that uh, that uh, that that we began to get become friends with. So I guess Indy was the place where we started getting our education on what was out there in National Biscuit Company. Although we never knew really what was out there, we didn't know that uh, Indy was a place to go to three times a year to find that. We met some important people in these early years of collecting uh, that were dealers in Indy. Charlotte and Dave Drain, who lived in Louisville, they set up in Indy. They sold us our first Suzu Clown doll. Uh, uh, the, uh, the Goods, Dorby Good and Mabel, lived in Iowa. They came to the show, and I met them kind of by accident. One day I was walking around the show, and I was carrying one of these cues. And Doran saw me, he said, do you like National Biscuit Company collectibles? I said, oh, we love them. So he introduced himself as Mr. Good. He worked for an insurance company, he was retired. Him and, he and his brother lived in, in Iowa. They came to every show. He said, I got some things you really like. I said, well, what do you have, Mr. And he told me it was Mr. Good. I said, what do you have, Mr. Good? He said, well, he said, I've got the original, you need a kid doll with the box. And he said, I've got the horse and wagon pull toy, and I've got the double bottom trailer, or the tractor trailer. And I said, oh my goodness, I love those. I said, would you like to sell them? He said, no. He said, we like them, and I'm not going to sell them. He said, uh, but he said, you know, in time, maybe I'll, I'll decide to let them go. He said, you're not a dealer, are you? I said, no, I'm not a dealer. We're, coll we're collectors. He said, well, I don't like dealers. He said, if I get rid of anything, I want it to stay. So we could became friends and began to, uh, to look for him in each uh, successive show. So as time went on, when I'd go to a show, I'd take him some samples up and give them to him. I'd meet him, and he, he, he talked to me, and we became really good friends. So in about 19, probably uh, 80, he called me one, one, one weekend at home before the spring show and said, Charlie, I'm coming to the show, and he said, I'm going to bring my toys with me, the doll, the truck, and the wagon. I'm, I'm going to sell them to you. And I said, oh, Mr. Good, I, I would love that. I said, this, you don't know how much how happy I am to have this happen. Because at that time, we didn't have a toy. We didn't have the wagon. We didn't have the truck. We didn't have the dolls. We had none of that. So he said, I'm going to bring them up there. And I said, well, Mr. Good, how much do you want for the three toys? I said, I'll bring you cash, you know, so I can just buy them. He said, I'll take 1200 for them. So we went to the show. Doran was there. I paid him his 1200 We got our first, first toys. This, this really made us feel good because then we were on a roll. We had the toys. We had been finding some things along. I think we found our first store rack in probably 1981 or two. We had done advertising for um, Nabisco things, and we found a few things by, by advertising on, in the news, the trade papers. The Antique Trader was one of them. Uh, so this kind of developed a little at a time, and I was still working my career at Nabisco, but all this time we were still going to Indy and finding things. Now before we... Uh, we bought these three toys from Mr. Good. Uh, uh, we went over to my boss's house, who lived right there by us in, uh, in Foxborough. And he, he was the branch manager, and his dad worked for the company. And his dad had given he and his brother, in the 1930s, a horse and wagon pull toy and a truck and trailer. And Don had these on, on display in his house. So we went over one day, and he had them on display. And uh, it was Christmas time, and he let Prissy and me, and me hold the, the wagon. And I was, I was just thrilled to be able to hold one of these toys because I'd never seen one outside of pictures. So anyway, after Christmas, we went on, and a few weeks after Christmas, I went to see him one day in the office, and he said, Charlie, he said, did you like those toys? I said, Don, I said, we didn't like those toys. We love them. And I said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to make you an offer on them. He said, well, I don't want to sell them. I said, well, let me make you an offer. He said, well, he said, uh, all right, what would you give me for those two toys, the truck and the, and the wagon? I said, I'll give you $1,000 cash for them. Tonight, I'll bring it over the house. Oh boy, that's a lot of money. He said, <laughs> that's a lot of money. But he said, no, Charlie, I don't think I could. If my dad gave them to me, I'm going to keep them. Well, needless to say, we didn't get to buy those, those toys. So right here, I'm going to show you the, the wagon, the pull toy. 1934, Rich Toys. It was put out, had all the Nabisco logo on it, as you can see. Had the little slicker boy inside it, driving. And it contained little paper-covered wooden packages of National Biscuit Company product. 
when you pull the horse, pull the wagon, the horse bobs up and down and looks like he's, he's trotting. This is lithographed. It's, it's a beautiful, beautiful toy. Uh, so it's already over 80 years old, 1934, about 80 years old. Uh, they're, they're hard to find. When you find them, you can expect to pay a minimum of, of anywhere from, if they're in good shape, $500 to $1,200 for them. So they're worth every penny of what you put in because they're absolutely beautiful. They're rich toys. So we got our first horse and wagon pull toy. We had some very unusual people, good people, who, who made our collecting uh, career really uh, fun and made it complete. Some of them by accident, like Mr. and Mrs. Good. Some of them, some of them we met at the show. Some of them I work with. I work with one man. His name was Kenny French. He was a driver. Kenny was a dealer an artist, and he also was a collector. Kenny, Kenny uh, traveled all around the, the, the little area here delivering cookies and crackers, and when he'd go out on a run somewhere, he may come in with his Nabisco truck, and they'd have the door up in the back of it, and one day he came into the office over there with the back door up on a Friday afternoon, and sticking out of the back of the truck was a giant crucifix. Well, Earl Walker saw it, and he said, Kenny, for goodness sakes, what are you doing with that crucifix sticking out of the back of the delivery truck? He said, he said boss, he said, I'm a I'm going to sell it. He said, I'm a dealer. I'm going to put my mall in the mall and sell it. So he never knew what Kenny was going to find. So anyway, Kenny was instrumental in some of our things, although I never got much from him to start with. He always led me on to believe he was going to find me something really good later on. Well, the ad show really uh, uh, was probably the most instrumental thing in the early years, 1980s, to help us collect. Prissy's going to join me later in the, in the video. She's working today, and I just wanted to sit down and put some thoughts on here about the early years and, and the things we found and, and, and the places and the people who helped make our, our collecting uh, of this country store, Mega Giant Nabisco, what it is. Two other people, that one other person that's that, that right off the uh, top of my head, I met him in Indy. I uh, never knew who he was. I knew his name. I knew he was the archivist of the company. His name was Dave Stavers. We went to the show one one uh, one spring. We would stand up on Andy waiting in line as always. When you get there, we get there two hours early. We go to Andy. We leave her at six. Get up there about eight. They open at ten. And by the time they opened, they'd have five hundred to a thousand people waiting to go in this really neat show called the Ed Show, best in the country. So we were waiting in line one day, and I looked back in the line. Here's this guy back there. He's got a Fig Newton T-shirt on. He's got a backpack that says Trisket on it. Uh, he was he was a walking billboard for Nabisco, and I told Prissy, he was a little short guy, I said, that's Dave Stivers. I knew him right off the hand. So we, and I told Prissy, went in, I said, we better try along because he's here, and he's if there's anything good here, he's going to find us. So we went in, started looking, and Prissy found a couple of jewels. The first thing she found was a Dutch girl scoop. The Dutch girl scoop is China, Warwick, China. It's a, like a bowl. Everybody thinks it's a bowl, but it's a scoop. It, it's got you need the you need a biscuit girl, the Dutch girl, on outside and in, outside on two places and inside. And at the time we found it, that Dutch girl, that was the only one we'd ever seen. It was extremely rare. Prissy got it, I think, for forty bucks. So after the show, we'd already checked the show out. And we found two or three things, and we were walking around. And I saw Dave Stivers there, and he had a gentleman with him. So uh, I went up and I introduced myself. I said, Dave, I said, I'm Charlie Brown. This is Prissy. We live in Louisville and we collect. And I said, I know you from, you know, pictures I've seen in the company magazines. And I said, we like Nabisco collectibles. He said, well, he said, I'm here with a, with a gentleman from Blue Bonnet uh, Margarine. He's, uh, in fact, he was president of Blue Bonnet Margarine. He said, and we're, uh, we're looking for things. He said, you find anything good? And Prissy said, well, yeah, I think I found something pretty good. So Dave was standing there and Prissy takes us out of the little bag she had, a little shopping bag. She pulls this little scoop out, uh, takes the tissue off of it, and holds it up and said, I found this scoop. Dave Stivers looked at that and he said, oh my goodness. Year was about 18, 1983, maybe, 82, 83. So he, he looks at the guy beside him and he said, now if I hadn't had you dragging you around this show, I'd have found that. So he told Prissy, he said, okay, Prissy. He said, how much do you want for it? Mm -hmm. Prissy said, I don't want to sell it. He said, all right, you'll sell it. He said, how much do you want for it? Prissy said, I don't want to sell it. Dave Stivers was carrying a checkbook, National Biscuit Company checkbook, Nabisco at the time. He laid it on the table there where we were standing. He opened it up. He said, you see that check? You put the amount in. I want the scoop. Prissy says, not for sale. I don't know what she could have put in there. 
I really think back a lot of times, maybe we should have put a big figure in and gone on with it. But on that side, we didn't. We kept it. And that developed our relationship with Dave. Dave was really instrumental in more ways than the fact that he was the archivist and talked about a lot of these things and was instrumental along with a few other gentlemen I'm going to tell you about in getting the old Nabisco country store in the forefront. So we went on through the late 80s and, 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 and kept making shows and kept buying. And late 80s, we put an ad in the Antique Trader, which was a paper that was, that was uh, put out of Nicetown, Indiana. And the paper uh, we put in there, National Biscuit Company Collectibles Wanted, you need a biscuit, Nabisco, you know, containers, uh, store furniture, whatever. And so we put the ad in, and one day, uh, we lived in Foxborough, we got a little note in the mail, and I, I looked at the envelope, and I thought, this can't be true. And I took it into Prissy, and I said, Prissy, look whose name's on this envelope. Well, believe it or not, the name on that envelope was Wayne W. Guest, Chatham, New Jersey. Chatham, New Jersey. I thought, oh my goodness, the vice president of the company sent us something. We opened it up, and there was a letter in there to us, said, dear, dear Mr. and Ms. Brown, said, I, uh, I have a nice collection of National Biscuit Company memorabilia, and I see you're, lo you're, you're looking for things. said, maybe I can supplement your collection with something. Lord, did I ever dream could he substitute or supplement our collection with something. This was the first time I'd, I'd had any correspondence with a man that we call now our mentor, and one of the finest individuals God ever put on this earth was Wayne Guest. He was, a, he was such a special person. Uh, it developed from here. It went, went into a lot of other things I can get into. But this was in about 1988. So from then to 92, we kind of just kept collecting. And we'd find things. And we were still having problems finding out what Nabisco put out. We knew they had a lot of things out. Every time we'd find something good, we'd say, oh, look at this. We still didn't have a doll. The dolls were probably the hardest thing we ever tried to find. The little, the little junior doll, the big you need a kid, the the Zuzu or the Zuzu, little Zuzu, and even above all things, we found a 24 inch Unita boy, but that's a long story and we'll come in later. So in 1992, when I retired uh, with the company, I went out on a medical with, with my knees and stuff with arthritis in them, they retired me. And uh, at that time, I decided, hey, I'm going to have some time on my hands. I'm going to see if I can start a collecting club with National Biscuit Company uh, collectors and people. That, that, that want to collect country store and that you need a biscuit and whatever and see if we can get a collecting club going. So I, I, I approached Dave Stivers who I'd met earlier on at Dad's show and he knew me. I said, Dave, I want to start a club and I want to call it, I don't want to call it yet, but I'm, I want to start a collecting club and I want to be able to do a newsletter and get the people in Nabisco to join and I think it'll go from there. So Dave, Dave went ahead and went, went into Nabisco and went up to to Shaverly or whoever he had to go to, I think it was Bob Shaverly. And with them and with Bob Shaverly's approval in the law department, uh, I, I gained the permission to use the seals in Nabisco. So that means that I could do, I've got the letters, I can do anything uh, with National Biscuit Company history, the products, the, uh, the anything that's relating to National Biscuit Company, I can use their trademark, Nabisco. The only thing that was in there was you never say anything detrimental about Nabisco. And guess, who could? I mean, I don't know anything detrimental to say about Nabisco. I, I love my job, and I still miss it. And they, they were a good company. So I got permission to use the inner seal and start the club. So Prissy and I were sitting in the in the country storeroom there one night, and we were trying to think of a name for the, for the club. And uh, I couldn't think of anything, and we were sitting there talking. And the first thing you know, I looked up over my head, and what was sitting there was the poly clock on the wall. I'd won that earlier. And I, on the poly clock is the, the poly, and underneath it has a seal. I said, Prissy, there's the name of the club, the Inner Seal Collecting Club. So then we decided, well, if we're going to do that, we've got to have a name for the, the newsletter. And of all things that the company ever developed, the, the patent or the trademark of the little oval with the seal, the little crucifix on top, that's what, what made this company recognizable outside of the the uh, trademark figure who came a little later after 1900. So we, I thought, well, the Inner Seal Collecting Club is called the Colophon. The Colophon is a symbol with the little circle, the crucifix, and inside it either had Inner Seal, NBC, or Nabisco. So that started our club, and that was the name of the club. From there, it started growing. I became better friends with Wayne. 
Uh, Wayne would call me. I'd start putting the newsletter out. I've still got the first newsletter that was ever put out. I'll show that a little later. Prissy's going to join me in some of these uh, talks and the videos as soon as I can get her where she's not working someday. I just wanted to do a little of this and put it on tape to see see what I can do, see how long I got on this camera with tape on it. But uh, this started our relationship with the man I call Mr. Nabisco, Wayne Guest. This man was a prince. The, I did the first newsletter. He joined the club. Dave joins the club. Uh, we had our first meet in 1995, had a nice turnout, and the club has grown since. Wayne Guest, I never realized, never dreamed of how much Nabisco uh, memorabilia and collectibles and antiques as this man had. He not only was vice president of the company, and everybody that knew him loved him, but he was also an avid collector. He had things that nobody even dreamed he had. So after we got to, we met each other, and I was doing the newsletter, he called me one day, and he started calling me boy. and say, boy, what are you doing? And I just figured he called me that because I was younger than him, and he just called me boy. But I found out later why he called me boy, and I'll tell you. What are you doing, boy? I said, well, I said, Mr. Guess, I'm, I'm just piddling around. I said, I'm thinking about the next colophon, what I'm going to put in it, and, you know, what I want to do. And he said, I'm going to tell you something. He said, they'll get better as time goes on. And he said, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, he said, I'm going to take you under my wing. And he said, when I'm done with you, I'm going to make you the most knowledgeable person about the history of National Biscuit Company living. And he said, that's, that's a, big, a big job, but you can handle it and I can do it. And I said, well, Mr. Guest, I'm, I'm, I'm flabbergasted that you would even, you know, consider doing this and, 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 and having me trust me that much. He said, I'm going to do it. So he took me under his wings. He, uh, he started telling me about different things. He'd send me pictures of his stuff. And then out of the blue, he might call me and say, Charlie, I'm going to send you a, a bread door push that went on the old stores. And of course, when I get it, it was mint. He'd also call me and say, I got, Charlie, I got a truck poster, a wagon poster. He said, I want to sell it. It's Santa Claus on it. He said, it's beautiful. He said, I could sell it anytime I want, but I want you to have it. So I thought, oh my goodness, Wayne, you're really going to let me purchase this? He said, yeah. He said, there's a dealer in New York City that I know. He wants to give me $1,200 for a Santa a, a wagon poster. Now, the wagon posters went on, on the outside of the old wagons. In any of the, any of the books you got or see the history of the company, you'll see these posters on the outside of the wagons. When the trucks came in, they started putting them on the trucks. They're extremely rare because they're paper, and when they were put up on the trucks or the wagons, they stayed up for a period of maybe a month, and then they were taken off, usually torn off, and destroyed. So any that survive are either they were never used or else they were in the the print shop or somewhere, or when they were taken down, somebody, the very few of these that you find were ever put on the trucks or the wagons. They wouldn't have survived. So he said, I'm gonna sell, he said, I want to sell this Santa poster. He says, 1924, it was on the wagons, but he said, this one never went on the wagon. He said, it's the one that has, that they used to make all of our wagon posters from. He said, it's got gold dust on it. And I thought, oh my goodness, this is unreal. He said, I want $400 for it. I said, well, Mr. Guest, I said, I'd love to have it, but you know, $400 is a lot of money. He said, don't worry about it. So I'm going to send it to you. You pay me a little time. Send me what you want. When I get my $400, just pay for it. And he did. He sent it to me in the mail. This was the first thing he sold me. Then a little later on in the, in the history of the Colophon, or Colophon, he called me one night, and he said, Charlie, he said, do you have the green books? And I said, no, sir, I don't. I said, I didn't think I'd ever need them. He said, oh, yeah, you do need them. He said, they came out in 1914, went to 1931. Well, I didn't know they went further than 31. They went to 35. But at this time, I didn't know that. He said, I tell you, you got to have them. He said, if you're going to do the newsletter and you're going to be good at what you do, you need to have these books. He said, inside those books is a complete month-by-month, -month, year year-by-year history of an early National Biscuit Company. Displays, uh, award, uh, products, uh, stories of the people who made this company popular. Number one, he said, everything's in there. He said, it's be they're beautiful books. I said, well, I said, uh, Mr. Guess, I'd like to have them. I said, but I don't have a set. He said, I got two sets. He said, I'm a, I want you to have one of them. So there again, I said, well, I said, I'd be flabbergasted to have them. I said, uh, you sure you want to sell one to me? And he said, I'm, I'm going to sell one to you. He said, you, I'm gonna want, I want $400 for, for a set of these green books. He said, you need them. If you don't have them, you can't do the newsletter. I said, I want them. He said, there again, I'll send them. You get, when you get them, send me so much a month. When you're paid off, they're yours. And I did this on a lot of things that he sold me early on when I first knew the man I called Mr. Nabisco. 
Well, the more he called me and the more he talked to me, the smarter I got and the more things, I, the more times I did the newsletter, the more he liked it. And every time I do a newsletter, I look for a phone call from, from Wayne and he'd tell me how good that newsletter was. It, it just built me up and made my head about the size of this room, knowing that Wayne thought that much of me and I was doing that good a job. Well, things kind of grew, and then other things happened that, that made this collection so neat. Uh, after we had the ad in the, in the Antique Trader, which Wayne answered early on, we had a man call us one night, must have been about 10 o'clock, and I answered the phone, and he said, uh, and he said, Mr. Brown, he said, uh, I live in Colorado, and he said, I deal in antiques and primitives, and he said, I got a couple of things you might be interested in. And I said, well, I probably would. I said, well, what do you have? He said, well, he said, I've got one of the little bowls with the, with the Anita boy on it. He said, I, I want that. I want to sell that to you. I want 40 bucks for it. And I thought, well, it would be, you know, okay. But they're, they're nice. I mean, but they're, they're not, they're common. And he said, I've got another little item you might like. He said, I got a horse blanket. Well, I almost, I almost swallowed my tongue. I said, <laughs> I didn't want to act like I was really excited. I said, you got, you got a horse blanket? Yeah, I got a horse blanket. He said, it's beautiful. It's quite large. He said, it's probably 10 foot long. Seven and a half, eight foot wide. He said it's giant. It went over the horses and it's got inner seal in the, in a seal in the middle of it. And he said it's absolutely beautiful. I said, oh my goodness. I, I, I said, I, I love to have it. I said, how much do you want for it? He said, well, he said, I'll tell you what. He said, I'll let you have it for $800. He said, uh, he said, if you want it, he said, I'm going to ship it to you. He said, when you get it, if you like it, send me the money and keep the blanket. And he said, pay the postage, which I think was about 30, 40 bucks on it. It was heavy. So when I got and opened it up, this blanket is pristine. I've got it hanging upstairs, and it's absolutely gorgeous. Uh, the, that was our first horse-related piece that we found from the old stables. They also had a lot of things in those stables. They had the, they had the tethers that are marked National Biscuit Company, extremely heavy, and they're, they're cast. They say National Biscuit Company on them, got a hook on them, and they probably weigh about 75 pounds, maybe a little more. And the drivers would, when they stopped to make the delivery, they would put the tether down, hook the horse to it, and that would hold the horse until they could come back and, and uh, take the horse off, you know, take it loose and go on with their next delivery. They always covered the horses in bad weather with these blankets, and it kept the horses from, you know, get, getting cold, and they, they, they took care of their horses. Well, this was another uh, coup de grace for us. We got, we got the horse blanket. Then times went on, and we started getting other things from Wayne. You know, he called me and said, I got these pieces. I'm going to send you Charlie, and I'm just going to give them to you. So he gave us a lot of stuff. Uh, we, we still made the ad show as we, as we went along. We met friends through the club, and this, this really started collecting National Biscuit in a big way. We found out by collecting that uh, probably there's, there's, there's about eight, cat eight or ten categories within National Biscuit Company. The, the, the hardest things to find are, is the paper of firma, trolley cards, truck posters, uh, anything relating to, to paper, window signs that were put out early on, early 1900s, with the, with the old logo on. I have, a, I have representative pieces of all of them and some beauties to go with it. The window signs, I call them window signs, they were put out at different times over the period of the early part of Nabisco. They were, they were probably uh, maybe... 30 inches tall, maybe 20 inches wide. All of them had, a, this, not all of them were the size, but the posters were, the window posters. They had a glue strip at the top and the bottom. And when you wet, you put took a little damp rag and, and, and wet that glue strip top and bottom, put it up in the window, pushed it to the window, and it kept the, the sign in the window, so the, the term window sign. These again, if you find them, were never put in the windows. They would have been, they would have been destroyed. We went to the ad show one time. Uh, and we passed up some jewels at that ad show. We went to the ad show and we were looking around and I looked down on the floor in this one dealer's booth and here sat a framed Uncle Sam window poster. If you got the green books about 1917 or 18, you'll find that Uncle Sam in there. He's holding the products. In fact, there might be one behind me back here on the wall and it's got Uncle Sam with all the products and it's got made as he says. I saw it. I like to have a fit. I got to looking at it and had a tear in it. So it, was, it had damage to it, and I told Prissy, I said, Prissy, look at this window poster, Uncle Sam. So we look at it, and we look at the price, it's $450. She said, offer the guy $250 and tell him he can keep his $200 frame. Well, he heard her say it, and he looked at us and said, there's no way I want $450 for it. We didn't buy it. We regret it to this day. We were up there another time, and one of the dealers, this is when Jerry Glenn, Jerry, 
Jerry was was with the company. He was he was in New Jersey. He was a DSM. He was a a, a sales manager. He went up through the company and finally wound up in New Jersey working with Wayne under Wayne. And uh, Jerry was an avid collector also. So he and and Wayne and Dave, who was up there, Stivers, they all pretty much kept National Biscuit Company things in the East Coast cleaned up. So uh, Jerry Glenn was also a dealer, and he called his his uh, his, his his collect his uh, you know the name of his his little country store selling group. Uh, what the heck you it? Uh, oh, he had a card, the Glens Country Store, and he had one of his cards had the Slicker Boy on it, another one had the Zuzu Clown on it. So I was in there looking around, and Jerry was set up, and there was a man in there from Florida whose name was Frank Spiel. And Frank had a, uh, a, a Muth bread store box. They went outside the stores. They put bread in them, you know, left it, and the, and the, and the grocer would come in, the bread would be outside the store, he'd take it in and, and, and put it on display. This Muth bread box was gorgeous. It was, it was shaped like a schoolmaster's desk, set about that, about that high, was painted in kind of a burgundy color, had three metal signs around on it that said Muth Bread. Kind of like this right here, but they were, they were metal, just like it, three of them. And it was gorgeous. So I'm, I'm sitting there and I say, uh, I told, uh, uh, I, t I went up to the dealer, I said, how much you want for that Muth Bread box? He said, I want $4.54. And I thought, oh my goodness, $4.50, this is great. So I went back to told Prissy, I said, there's a Muth Bread box over there, it wants $4.54. So in the meantime, we, we were coming around to the to the booth, and Jerry Glenn was there, and I told Jerry, I said, Jerry, there's a bread, youth bread box over there for $4.50. I said, you think I ought to buy it? Oh, no, I don't buy that. That's too much money for that. He said, I wouldn't pay that. Well, needless to say, I listened to Jerry and didn't, didn't buy it, and Prissy hates me to this day because she wanted to buy it. Well, we didn't buy it, we've never seen another one since. Never seen another one. A lot of the things that, that we saw in our early years of collecting, either through the antique trailer at auctions or whatever, we haven't seen since. One time we found a full set in that antique trailer of the alphabet boxes. These are the little boxes with the letters on them that, that had the that National Biscuit put out. They were shaped like alphabet letters. They were the base a cookie of the of the animal cracker and they were in, in little cues, had inner seal on the end of the boxes. Some of them had strings on them. And they were called the alphabets. So there was a full set in there one time at an auction. I put a $450 bid on it and lost it. Didn't even get it. So this, this, <clears throat> this was, these were, there were things we missed. And, and we still don't have them. Now I have the alphabet boxes, but I don't have that Muth Bread store box. I got other store boxes, and I'll show you some as we go along. This video, I'm doing it because I wanted Wayne for years to, to do a video. Sit down and just talk. Wayne, just sit down. Turn the camera on and talk about what you know about the company. Because if something happens to you, Wayne, it's gone forever. You can only talk about it when you're alive. And I said, please do it. Well, he never did. Wayne never did. So Wayne's gone. So a lot of the things that we saw over the years that we, we didn't get or we lost out on or, you know, they sold for more money than we wanted to pay, uh, we've never seen since. I guess maybe the one of the hardest things to find that we finally came across, and it took us forever, was a, you need a Biscuit Boy doll. The dolls were made by Ideal Doll and Toy Company, uh, and, and, and they, they, were, they were put out in 1914, Ideal Top Novelty Company. They were put out to look just like that little boy that they used as a mascot or as a, a trademark figure, Gordon Steele. Gordon Steele was the little boy that they picked in 1901 to have a photo made of him. He was a nephew of an advertising executive at N.W. Aaron Company, and he was picked, he was five years old, to, uh, st to have his picture made with a raincoat, a rain hat, boots, holding a box of crackers. And this, when Adolphus Green saw this little, little boy's picture, he was, he was ecstatic. When they made that picture in 1901, on a glass with glass negatives, they made five. One of them went to his mom and dad. The other four went to Nabisco. When Adolphus Green saw the the, the uh, glass negatives, out of the four he had, he only liked one of those negatives. And the one he liked, every piece of advertising with the "You Need a Kid" or the "You Need a Boy" on it was made from that negative. Every piece. 
No other negative was ever used, and no other person was ever used as the you need a kid except Gordon Steele. This little five-year-old boy, when, they, when, his, when his photo was made in 1901, he became the most widely recognized person outside of the President of the United States known in 1901. They made dolls of him. They used him on bows. They used him on trolley cars. They used him on window posters. They used him on in magazines. They put his image out everywhere. And his image was associated. The raincoat became known to symbolize freshness, the little boy purity, and the cracker box, you need a biscuit. That negative that was made of that little boy in 1901 still survives. The only one that Bisco ever used was in a, the possession of Adolphus Green. Was was given to a vice president of the company sometime in the early 60s, early 70s. The man was Wayne Guest. I had no idea Wayne had it negative. Uh, so when Wayne passed away in 2007, uh, that negative was left to his family. It was in his family stuff. A lot of his stuff was sold before Wayne passed away. Uh, Wayne didn't wouldn't sell anything, he, unless it was to me. He sold very little stuff. Wayne, before he passed away, became started being getting sick. He had problems. Uh, he'd be forgetful. He was, you know, he had he had problems with his health. And it, I wouldn't hear from him for a while after I did the coal find. I'd always be concerned what happened to him. He'd call me finally and say, "Say, boy, I've been uh, I've been under the weather." But he said, "I'm back." And he said. Uh, uh, I just hadn't felt good, but he said, I'm back talking to you. So, but he moved from New Jersey. He lived in Chatham. He moved from New Jersey to, with his son Jerry outside of Chicago uh, in, in, to, in Illinois. His, his son moved him down there. And when he was going to move, he had to downsize. So, Wayne got sick. He, uh, he was sick. He wasn't feeling it good. And he told Jerry, he said, Jerry, I want to sell this stuff. He said, I'm going to take it to auction and sell it. Well, Jerry asked him, say, well, you really don't want to sell your, your painting you have that you need a boy, do you, Dad? The one that they used for all the, the uh, advertising for the company. It was made so they could substitute the box of You Need a Biscuit with any other product they wanted to hold or the newer logo of You Need a Biscuit, which changed with the seals of the company from you need, from Interseal to NBC, NBC Unita, and finally Nabisco. I said, yeah, I'm going to sell it all. Well, they took it to an auction. Edwards Auction sold it. They did a beautiful catalog for that sale. Jerry Glenn was instrumental in, in getting the auctioneer to do it. He did the, I've got two of the catalogs there somewhere, I can't find them, but they were beautiful. Wayne wound up getting about $75,000 for his things. A lot of the things that were sold were priceless. And you can take it from me, and our collection is quite large. Wayne did not get near from that collection what it should have been. They bundled stuff together in groups, trolley cars together, instead of selling things separate. Needless to say, after Wayne was, finally got his money for it, and he got back to himself, he called me one day and said, Charlie, I'm sick. He said, not literally, but I'm just sick because I sold my stuff. He said, uh, uh, I think I got beat out of some of it. They hauled stuff out of my house. I've never gotten paid for it. He said, one group that took stuff out of here, I've tried to call them. They've changed their number. And he said, they're not even been. So he got ripped off. Well... They took a lot of these things and sold them, and I didn't buy anything at that auction, not one piece. Uh, not that I wouldn't like to have, but it went for big dollars. The painting went for 14000 I think, of the kid. I don't know if you can see this one on the wall up here by me or not, but that's the identical painting of the one they sold uh, in the Edwards auction. This was done for Wayne when he retired, and all the DSMs and the people in Nabisco, including Chaberly, they all signed the back of that. It was given to Wayne as a, as a present when he retired from the company. When he passed away, his family gave that to me and Prissy for friendship with him. We treasure it. That's, uh, we got a lot more than that, and it would take me a while to tell you all we got. I mean, I just, I, that man, I would give it all back to him today if I could just have him back as my friend because I, I really love the guy. He was, uh, I never dreamed I could deal with the vice president of the company. When I was a sales rep, I never got past Louisville. I mean, you know, the, they they didn't deal with those peons as sales reps. But when I started this club, I went right to the top. In fact, Mr. Shabley was in our club, and I got personal letters from him to me and Prissy, I treasure. And uh, I got to even know the president of the company, all because of this club. 
National Biscuit Company Country Store is the absolute most beautiful country store advertising in existence. They have such a variety of products. They sold breads. They sold cereal. They sold cookies and crackers. They sold spaghetti. They sold candy. Everything they sold, there's a piece out there with National Biscuit Company on that item. And this isn't garbage either. This is good quality. Quality pieces that were well made. Solder tins, paintings, lithos, gorgeous pieces. We've got a lot of that in our collection and we treasure it. If we had to start collecting again, it would be impossible to gather what we have because it's too extremely expensive. It just, it, we'd be priced out of the ballpark. But that's why we're going to do this video. We want everyone to have a chance to see what this company, we know as National Biscuit Company, put out and how they treated their people and what is still out there for us to collect. And the things that have been either given to us or shared with us or bought by us is, is to be protected because it should be saved. Getting back to the, the little Adolphus Green uh, and the Union you you need Boy Gordon Steele, that negative that they made, of the four that were made, Adolphus Green like one, and that's the one they spent all their money on, that negative was given to Wayne Guest, and when he passed away, that negative was given to Prissy and myself. We have that negative. We treasure it. It's about this big. It's absolutely gorgeous. 1901. Probably would have to be the, the first Model T, uh, the first Bell Telephone, whatever. It, it started this company being what it is today, Nabisco. We found out last year where Gordon Steele's buried. He's buried in Pennsylvania. We're planning on next year uh, his monument. Well, you know, we found him. I had one man ask me, he said, how do you know that's Gordon Steele? He said, you fall for all that garbage and that's Gordon Steele. Everybody tried to claim he was Gordon Steele, which they did over the years. Every mom had their kid with, the kid was knocked in the head and they took a photo of him and stuck an un a raincoat on him and he was the unique boy or the unique kid. Well, Nabisco knew better because they knew who he was and they had documents signed by him telling who he was and only one was Gordon Steele. And I have all those documents, copies of them. So, he passed away in 1960. We didn't know where he was buried at, and last year we found his gravesite. And this one individual asked me, "How do you know it's the Gordon? Uh, how do you know it's Gordon Steele?" Everybody tried to be Gordon Steele. I said, "Listen to me, it's Gordon Steele." So when we found him, Dale found him. Dale's a guy. He found Gordon Steele. He found Adolphus Green's gravesite. We know where both of them are now. When he found Gordon Steele, there was only one Gordon Steele in Pennsylvania that was born in 1895. So this was the guy that we figured was Gordon Steele, and we went after him. And we finally found out that he's buried, <clears throat> he's buried in Pennsylvania. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and his gravesite, on his gravesite, is buried with him, Joseph Geisinger. Joseph Geisinger is the uncle who brought Gordon to the photographer to have his photo made. His aunt is buried there with him. His mom, his mom is buried there, Paul, Pauline Geisinger. His dad, Frank Geisinger, they're all buried there with him in that grave, in those graves. After I found out he was there, I contacted the cemetery and I told him who he was. And I've sent him quite a few pieces of, of his memorabilia. I sent him a scoop, I sent him a Alec Crackerbell book. I wanted him to know who he was. That this young, this man, Gordon Seale, buried at that gravesite. Is, is the you need a boy or the you need a kid and he's a famous person. Uh, so I was talking to the to the cemetery owner about a month ago. I told him we want to try to get a marker made to put on Gordon's gravesite telling who he is, kind of like they did to the Cream of Wheat Man three, several years ago. So we're in the process of doing that. And if everything works out, we're going to do it in 2015 have a meet in Pennsylvania in, in uh, Pittsburgh. So we put this on the, on his grave site and have a meet up there and have people out there at the grave site. So I told the man at the cemetery, I said, listen, I had a guy, his name's Kevin. I said, Kevin, I had a man question how I knew that was Gordon Steele, the, the Gordon Steele, that he need a kid buried in that, in that grave. And I said, the only way I can put it to you, Kevin, is this way. Because Kevin had already found out about the raincoat, who he is. I already seen a bunch of stuff. He loved it. In fact, they got it in there. 
cases up there at the cemetery. I said the only way that I would know more fully that that's Gordon Steele laying in that grave is if uh, he was sitting on the tombstone in his raincoat. And this guy, this guy in the cemetery almost had a cow. He said, I've never heard it. I said, that's the only way I know. I said, yeah, that's him. So after I found out who was buried with Gordon, that cemented the, uh, his, his burial location. Our collection has thousands and thousands of pieces in it. And we're going to do this in kind of two, two or three videos. I want it for, for posterity. I want it for future generations to be able to tell uh, what was done and what was out there and how, what a vital role Nabisco played in the early country stores that cemented the freshness and made the crackers what they are today. National Biscuit Company was also the company that started the UPC seal. That was instrumental in, in having the UPC seal sign, sign, uh, uh, code put on the product boxes. I've got a letter from Bob Shaverly telling, us, telling me and Prissy about how it happened that he was involved in that. The National Biscuit Company did that. So the seals on all these products was developed by National Biscuit Company. Some of the things that, that, that are rare, uh, truck posters, extremely rare. I have seven. Trolley cards, I don't care what condition they're in, they're absolutely beautiful. You will see all of these in, 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 a, in a video that follows this. Uh, uh, some of these really neat things. The, uh, the store furniture, really neat. Any kind of racks, uh, everything was marked National Business Company. They have a table out. It's got National Business Company with the inner seal in it. It's extremely rare. They're beautiful. The bread boxes that went outside the stores. I've got one with National Bread on it with the eagle with milk paint on it. it has to date to 1900. I've got them with Tecla Bread, uh, NBC Bread. Showcases. Showcases are extremely valuable, extremely hard to find. They are marked National Biscuit Company in the glass or on the front. They're gorgeous. Reverse glass. There's one sitting right here. I don't know if you can see it or not. I hope it's wide enough angle to catch us. And I'm hoping I'm on, on this camera okay because I had to start it up again. So as we go along, Prissy will be joining me. She's, she's at work today. And she's going to sit down and we're going to talk about some of the rarest pieces we have. Uh, we're going to take you in the country storeroom. We're going to show you our, our collection in there. Every room in our house has National Biscuit Company antiques and collectibles on display. Some of my favorite pieces, uh, I, can, I can put them down. What are they? Well, I've got pieces I only know of one in existence. The glass negative. The, uh, the horse tether. Uh, the, uh, uh, the potato chip bag. National Biscuit Potato Chips. The NRA sign. That doesn't mean National Rifle Association. That's National Relief Act. Uh, the dolls are extremely rare. We have the only 24-inch you need a kid in existence. He's a, he shows his age. He's 100 years old this year. Happy birthday. You need a kid. Uh, he's, he shows his age. He's beautiful. He's the only large one we have. Zuzu, anything Zuzu is so rare and so beautiful. The Zuzu clown... Probably the most beautiful trademark figure that was ever ever put out for Zuzu Ginger Snaps. Here's the part about Zuzu. This is Zuzu, by the way, as you can see. It had Zuzu cookies on it, Ginger Snaps. That's neat. Paper label. World War I. Zuzu is so mysterious. Halloween, right, from the word go. Wayne guessed Mr. Nabisco. The only thing I really got with Wayne talking about collectibles or antiques, thank God I got it, and, and Jerry sent it to me. It didn't even know it existed. Wayne went through the show in World Headquarters in 1991 when, National, when Nabisco had all their antiques and collectibles set in, inside the lobby in World Headquarters in, New, in uh, Persephone, New Jersey. And Wayne walked through that collection and took us on a walking tour of that collection. And he does an excellent job. I treasure it. It's about two hours. Uh, he, uh, he, talk, he shows some of the most beautiful things that ever were put out. 
in that in that show, a lot of the things in that show that were on display belonged to people that worked in World Headquarters. That a lot of the boxes belonged to Dave. Uh, the uh, a lot of the containers belonged to Wayne. Uh, everybody, a lot of it didn't belong to Nabisco, which they had a museum in in uh, uh, Waterloo Village at that time belonged to collectors who worked at the company and it was an absolute beautiful walkthrough of history. I just love it. I sit and watch it every day. A lot of things in that video were in our collection. So a lot of the boxes, the signs, the tins, some of the signs that were in there are now in our collection. Not because they were given to us by anybody in the show, but we have them and they had them in that show. Where they came from, who we got them from, I don't know. The biscuit boxes, a lot of them in there, they, they gave them to us and in about 2008 or 9, uh, I had a hundred of them. It cost me fourteen hundred dollars to ship them, but he gave them to us. He collected them. Uh, in that collection, walking through, there's two items in there that we have never seen any other of, and we know they had to be out there somewhere. But only two we know of were in that in that show: the Zuzu clown suits. Zuzu, when it was put out in 1902. Uh, with the clown, they put the dials out, 1914, the little one and the big one, and we got four of them, two and two on. We'll show them to you in another video in the other room. They, National Biscuit Company furnished costumes to the kids at that time and to the adults of Zuzu clown suits, and they could borrow them from the company, and they were in parades, they were in costume balls, they were everywhere. Every picture in the green book's got 18 or 20 clowns wearing those clown suits in those, in those pictures. They're everywhere. Every town, every burg, every everywhere, every state had thousands of Zuzu clown suits. We can't find a one. We've been looking for 25 years. Only two I've ever seen was in that video, and I don't know who put them in there. Been trying to find out. Nobody knows. I don't know where they went. They're beautiful. That is the rarest. Well, it's not the rarest, but it's they're the, one of the rarest things that, that you could ever find is a Zuzu clown suit. We have the dolls, that's bad enough. I mean, I do have those. We have the trolley cards, but the clown suits themselves, where did they go? Well, the, the dolls survived from 1914. Why wouldn't the clown suits? Why don't clown suits survive? We got truck posters from, from 1924. No clown suits. I keep thinking that somebody's going to have great-grandmother uh, brown dye, and inside her trunk in an attic, they're opening it up, and there's a Zuzu clown suit in there that belonged to great-grandpa brown, who worked for the company in the and <laughs> early part of the, of the century, and they're in there. But that's so far I haven't found them. You'll see things in our collection that you'll never see again. We have driver's uniforms from 1902, 1903, hat, the coat, shirt, the buttons, everything. Uh, we've, got, we've got the boxes, we've got the tins, we've got everything. So our collection is pretty complete. Uh, we could we could do a we could do a video of, of our things and, and I think it would be well real really well uh, received. Now that the club has started, 20 years this year, 19, 1994, we know now of the things that National Biscuit Company put out that we had no idea existed 20 years ago. The Cola Fund has brought things to to our members and to a lot of you watching this, shown you these beautiful artifacts from this great company, Nabisco. When they put these things out, they weren't thinking about history. They weren't thinking about what they're worth or what they're going to be done. They thought, hey, they'll be gone. They're not going to survive. A lot of the early things from, from Barnum's Animal Crackers in 1902, the string, put out at Christmas time in 1902 with the string on it, was only released as a Christmas cookie. When the cookie was emptied, or was, was eaten, the box could be hung on the tree with a little string as a Christmas ornament. They sold so many the first year that they decided to keep them year-round. And today, over 110, 12 years later, Barnum's Animal Crackers are the number one animal cracker sold. They not only put the animal cracker out in the string, they put a lot of other things out in string with the string on it, the string box. They put no. They put uh, Noah's Ark. They put you like them pretzels. They put Tudor folks. They put uh, flagship cookies, cowboys and Indians. 
uh, some of the others they put out. I'm peeking over here, cheating on you. Rocket ship. They had a bunch of different cowboys and Indians that said that. They had a lot of products put out over the years with the string, and some of them are extremely rare. Extremely rare. We've got, we paid 600 for one of ours. It's a, a flagship cookie, 1948. I'll show it to you later, hopefully. Uh, the scoops, I was talking about scoops. The bows, the China bows, with either the Dutch girl or the you need a kid on the bows was a scoop. Furnished to the grocer when they bought the product, it was inside this, packed inside this thing right here. And when you, when you took them out, you scoop up. Scoop of those cookies in that scoop was five cents. And they put them in a bag and that was five cents. The Dutch girl is, is rare. The Yina kids more common. They had more of them. The one that's a jewel is a glass. Now we had the you need a big biscuit chocolate glass, Greentown Glass Company. It's chocolate glass, it's beautiful. It's 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 a but they have it's got a a brownish tint to it or look to it. It's kind of rough outside and it's called You Need a Milk Biscuit, National Biscuit Company. We found the matching one to it by accident about seven or eight, ten years ago. Not many were made, probably less than fifty. They were clear scoops made by Greentown Glass Company. They had five cents National Biscuit Company on them. I have one in the case, I think, here, or it's in the other room. I'll show it to you in a later video. They just sold one of those online for $800. That's, that's, that's mind-boggling. Uh, our, our, our country store history is, is vast. Uh, we, we, we could talk all day on it. The individuals who have made this possible from Dave Stivers, the archivist, which got us permission to use the seals of Nabisco, to Wayne Guest, to Jerry Glenn, uh, to uh, uh, the Goods, to to Charlotte and Dave Drain, even some of the new club members. One of our and I can't mention anybody in, in a club member without talking about all club members. Uh, the the toys, the dolls, the rare things. The Unita boys, the kids, were put out with either the composition head and hat, the little one, or the Composition coat and hat with a romper. They also put out another one that there's only one known to exist besides the big one, the 24 inch one. We got that in the other room. They put out one called the Sleep Eye. You need a kid. And he's just, he looks like he's porcelain when you see him. I've got one up here on the mantle. Uh, I don't know if I showed that when I started, but I'll show some video here in a minute of some of the things that's living there. Uh, he's, he looks porcelain, but he's not. He's marked in a diamond on his back, a diamond thing on his back says, uh, the you need a kid, Ideal Dollar Toy Company. The rest all have it on the sleeve on his raincoat that says Ideal Dollar and a Toy and Lobby Company, 1914. You need a kid. That's the only sleep eye you need a kid we have ever seen. And he's he's sitting up on the mound. He his eyes open and shut, and he walks. You can walk him. He's extremely rare and absolutely beautiful. He's a hundred years old this year. Uh, the uh, you know uh, you can get into a lot of things and we're going to get into a lot of our stuff. We're going to walk you through some of the pieces when Prissy comes in. I want Prissy to join me on the next one. Dale, without Dale, I don't know what I do. He's been uh, we got two sons, Dale and Chuck, and Dale Dale's a collector. Chuck likes to collect too. He's a plumber. Dale's from Metro Police, but Dale's the one that's, that's that wants a collection. And if something happens to us, that's where it's going to go. He's going to protect it. My dream is to uh, open a uh, a, a National Biscuit Company Museum up and have these pieces where people can come in and see this history of this fabulous company known as Nabisco. <clears throat> we had a show in October. It turned out to be a fantastic show. We had people come from all the country. We had four cu two couples from California. Drove, one of them drove 7,000 miles to get here and they're both just sweethearts. Uh, I, I, I'll get into some of the members later. but. Uh, they, uh, they, we had a ball. Becky Toussaint came. She's with the, she's the archivist for, for Mondelez now, out of uh, Illinois. Uh, they, uh, she came and, and we took her through the history of the company, and she was amazed. Uh, she's a super nice lady. She's Dave's replacement. So, we know the history. We have the history. I'm working on a, a, a driver's buggy. I'm, I'm restoring over the barn. I, uh, I think it shows in some of the video I've got uh, from the show. I want to do a delivery wagon. I'm going to build it myself. I'm looking for the frame for it, an old farmer's wagon. I'm going to do it. You can't find one. There's probably no more in existence. So 
So I'm going to do one mobile up. I have a delivery truck that's, uh, that's uh, 1983, it's an actual truck. I'm restoring that. I'm going to put it back in the gold and uh, maroon colors. Get ready to paint it this summer and put the decals on it. So we love the, we love collecting. We love the inner seal. We love country store. Uh, and Prissy likes bears. She likes Santa. She's got other collecting fields. But this these net these comp, these pieces are becoming harder and harder to find. The uh, trolley cards and the truck posters are now considered works of art. They sell for big dollars. The uh, repros. Uh, they are reprowing some paper stuff, you got to be careful. But most of our early signage, uh, signs and, and window posters, truck posters, they're dated. You can tell the difference. The trolley cards have a stripe on the back or they say National Biscuit Company on the back. So, I, I mean, I'm not going to be fooled by them and anybody that's in the club wouldn't be fooled by it. So we know what it is. So, uh, this, this is just a little introduction uh, uh, of what I wanted to say uh, about the club starting in, in, in 1994. Uh, it all started with a dream of one man who wanted to be uh, to come out with a product that would be recognized nationally, sold nationally, would stay fresh, and that, that people would, would, would associate with, with Nabisco, National Biscuit Company, and that product was You Need a Biscuit. This is an original box from 1914, or not, 19, I'll get my dates right here. Uh, it's you need a biscuit. It's it was never nothing was ever put in it. It's pristine. This was a schoolhouse package. When I say schoolhouse package, these were sent. You need a biscuit, ginger snaps, premiums, graham crackers, and these type boxes, all marked inner seal, were sent to the schools in the early part of the century, uh, 20th century, and they had little miniature stores set up in these schoolrooms, and these products were on the shelf. And the kids could learn to, to do math by operating these little general stores, these little stores, and selling these products. And of course, like Wayne said in one of his letters, what it did was brainwash the kids to buy Nabisco. I don't like to use that word, but <laughs> they did a good job. Nabisco never, they never missed an opportunity to, to sell a product. Whether it was on the side of a building with a big giant painted sign, do you know you need a biscuit? Yes, certainly. I know you need a biscuit. At the entrance to Ellis Island in New York at the turn of the century, and that's where a lot of the immig immigrants to, the, to our country came in, to Ellis Island, there was a, a billboard that was probably a block long, uh, 20 foot tall, that had a box of you needed biscuits on it. National Biscuit Company, do you know you needed biscuits? So all these immigrants coming into this country would see this product. It was five cents. They sold thousands and thousands of boxes in the first year that they were introduced. Adolphus Green was a was a neat guy. Uh, I've studied him. He was Catholic. I hope that didn't do with anything. He could have been Presbyterian. Uh, but he was a very unique person. He had two ways to do business. He had two ways to do business when it, when Adolphus Green was the second president of, of National Biscuit Company. He turned it down the first time. You could do it his way or Adolphus Green's way. And there was no other way. And he had very few, he was a good man, he knew what he wanted to do, but he had very little patience with people. Uh, when he got ready to go to lunch, he got up to go to lunch, all of them followed him in step and they all went to the cafeteria. Uh, if he wanted to fire you when you worked for him in, in, New, in Chicago, you go to lunch, and when you come back and go up into the offices of Nabisco, you look, he'd take you over and show you, show you the view from the window. <laughs> On the street below, your desk was sitting down there. <laughs> That's how you knew he fired you. That's kind of cold. I mean, how would you like to go to lunch, come back and see your desk down there and know you're gone? He got in an argument one day. The, the uh, offices there in Chicago, uh, he took great, great care and, 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 and pride in, the, in his bakeries and cleanliness of the bakeries and people who worked there. So he comes back from lunch one day and sitting out in front of the bakery is a couple of garbage trucks and they must have stunk. So, so uh, Adolphus uh, says, who's, who do they belong to? Well, he found out they belonged to the garbage man across the street. So he, the guy comes over 
and he uh, he meets him out front and he says, uh, I want you to move these garbage trucks out in front of my bakery. He said, they stink. I give my bakery a bad, a bad name. Garbage man said, you and who else? He said, I'm telling you, I want those garbage trucks moved. Uh, they, said, they said this guy was about 6'4 or 5. He looked at the office screen and he said, uh, the only way they're going to be moved is if you uh, are man enough to make me move them. Well, needless to say, the office screen put a cigar in his mouth went on in the bakery. And they eventually moved the garbage trucks. But he didn't take him on. He was a kind person, too. In 1914, every, every, I'm sorry, 1917, Every employee of the National Biscuit Company was given a gold, $5 gold piece for Christmas. They had special meetings all over the country, and every employee, whether he was a, a, a laborer, just cleans the floors, he was a, a janitor, or he, was a, he worked in the bakery, or he was a, a manager, or whatever, every single employee all over the country for Christmas was given a $5 gold piece by Dolphus Green. Merry Christmas. If you had one of them today, it would be worth quite a bit of money. Now, I had a chance to buy one of these a few years ago. And uh, you might say, well, how did you know it was a $5 gold piece that he gave out? Well, I, I knew it was. Because that when he gave those out in 1914, he gave them out in a little envelope that had National Biscuit Company on it. Merry Christmas, Dolphus Green. And it was had the final gold piece. It was still in that envelope, and I didn't buy it. I'm thinking it's probably been 20, 20 years ago. I think the guy wanted 400 for it. A little high, a little high for a final gold piece then, but maybe it wasn't. Uh, so he, he had his good points and his bad points. And when he would go visit a, a bakery. When, he, when they knew he was coming, the managers would almost have a nervous breakdown. He'd go in, get off, park his train car, get off, and go into the bakery where it was. And all these, bakeries had, all these bakeries had train reels so he could go right to the bakery, pull up to the bakery in his train car, and get off and go in the bakery and examine it and go back where he was going, New York, Chicago. And his, his, big th his, his train car he used was called Nazu. And the Nazu had a, it was, it was carried around the country by the New York, New York, uh, uh, if I tell you that, uh, the, 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 the train, the train company, uh, the train, uh, thing was, uh, New York Central. And he, he, he always wanted his, uh, he always wanted his train car on the end of the, the, the train, on the last car. They didn't like to do that, but they did. But when he go in a bakery and, and, uh, check it out, he'd go in and start running his hand over the top of the doorways with a white glove on. And if he found any dirt, lo and behold, the, the manager who was there. So one day, uh, he went to one location somewhere out in the country, went in for his examination, and the uh, the bakery manager was playing golf. He wasn't there. So Dolphins went in, did his thing, left, went back to Chicago where he was from, and the manager came up, came in the next day from playing golf, and he said, "We." The guy told him, "said You missed Dolphins Green yesterday. He was in there examining the bakery." Well, this guy almost had a heart attack. He said, oh my goodness, he said, you mean the president was here and I wasn't here and he examined, oh, he, I, I, it's terrible. He said, I know I'm gone. I know I'm gone. My dog, my dog is, is barking. Cody, come here, honey. So anyway, he wrote a letter to Adolphus Green and apologized for not being there when he came in to the meeting. And Adolphus Green wrote him back and said, you don't have to worry about it. He said, I know why you were golfing now. He said, that, that, ba that, that bakery is in such good shape. He said, you needed some time off. So he said, I can see you're working hard. I'm going to quit right there, leave it there, and we're going to have another. Appreciate you joining me next time we come on, and we're going to start talking about some rare pieces that, that took a while to find and show you some of the collection, and I think you'll enjoy it. Take you into Country Storeroom, and I apologize for my, my dog here, Cody. He's a puppy. We got him about a year and a half ago. He's, he's lab. He's big. And uh, he's just a baby, but he, he you know, he, I have to worry about no prowlers. Uh, but anyway, it's been fun talking to you. I wish Prissy had been on here to, to kind of share some of these stories, but in the video which follows this up, we're going to let Prissy do a lot of the talking of her memories of how this collection that we have started and how our love of the company and the National Business Company, our, our knowledge of what was put out and, and what's out there, uh, how it all started. So thanks. Hope you had a good time, and we'll be seeing you in the next video with more of the history of this little product called You Need a Biscuit.